The Enneagram is a cultural phenomenon that markets itself as an enigmatic personality test that has recently taken churches and Christian circles by storm. This thing called the Enneagram really, really share all of the human spectrum of the beauty that God's designed in us and, and the, the brokenness, brokenness that sin has caused in us. Many of you probably know your own Enneagram number, and you could even tell someone what number they are just by observing their personality and hearing their hopes and fears. At first glance, this system seems like just another personality test, like Myers-Briggs or the DISC profile. But as you will see, this couldn't be further from the truth. The reality is, is that the Enneagram appears harmless, but is actually anything but. More than just a fun way to learn about your personality and the personalities of those around you, the Enneagram has occult origins and even demonic influence. But despite this, some Christians are using it in place of the Bible as part of study material for church small groups, Bible studies, and even Sunday sermons. Our main goal is to help you understand your core motivations and beliefs because we want you to see how those are met in Jesus. At its core, the Enneagram ignores sin and it creates obsessions with teaching a worldview that's not a biblical one. In this episode, we dive into the Enneagram, what it is, where it came from, and how it's wrapping its tentacles around Christians and churches across the nation, acting as a gateway into progressive ideology. As always, I'm your host, Lucas Miles, and you're watching Church and City. My name is Lucas Miles. I'm an ordained minister and best-selling author. The church has been invaded. By whom? Same ideology that's attacking our state, Marxism. They want a church that bows down to the state. They want a church that worships the state. So if you want to stay informed on the most critical issues regarding religious freedom and the Christian faith, then you've come to the right place. This is Church and State. Welcome back to Church and State. I'm your host, Lucas Miles, and today we are talking about the Enneagram. Now, before we dive into the history of the Enneagram, the founders, and some of the weird and wacky and honestly frightening events that led up to the formation of this so-called personality test, I want to start by kind of breaking down just simply and mechanically what is the Enneagram. First of all, when we look at this, the Enneagram is marketed as a journey to self-discovery. Now, that right there sounds a little bit new agey, and there's probably a reason for that because it is. But the Enneagram specifically, it could be described as an irregular hexagon. It has nine points, and each of these points represent a different personality or a different personality type within the framework of the Enneagram. Now, interesting enough, I used to think that the Enneagram was sort of something that was really developed maybe outside of the church, and in many ways it was, but the modern sort of launch of the Enneagram, the popularity of the Enneagram seems to be mostly geared around Christian circles, which makes this even more reason that I believe as believers who care about our faith and believe in the authority of God's word, that we should be well aware of what the Enneagram is and that we shouldn't really fall prey to this sort of deceptive and borderline occultic practice within our own Christian circles. So let's get into this a little bit. When you take a look here at a diagram of the Enneagram, what you're gonna see is that there are nine personalities. Within these nine personalities, you have reformer, helper, achiever, individualist, investigator, loyalist, enthusiast, challenger, and peacemaker. And see, each of these personalities has four different word traits that are associated with them. So for instance, if you're an Enneagram 7, the enthusiast, your words would be spontaneous, versatile, acquisitive, and scattered. And essentially what the Enneagram promotes is that this personality type, this number that you received, it's not just maybe how you're behaving currently or how you might behave under stress based upon certain factors in your life right now. According to the Enneagram, this is who you are this is your identity, and this is something that cannot change. This is one of the things that makes the Enneagram very different than, say, the Myers-Briggs test or the DISC profile, which are really more of just snapshots of how you are in your personality right this moment. What is your psychological health at this given point in history, rather than really a sentence over your life, a statement over your life of this is who you are. As Christians, this should raise a red flag right away because we know Know that we are not the summation of a personality test. We are, first and foremost, who God says that we are. And in that is a big difference. 
So along with these numbers, the Enneagram 7, Enneagram 9, and, and when you start talking to people that have kind of become students of the Enneagram, they're very quick to point out their number. Oh, are you a 3? You're a 7, aren't you? Are you a 6? Well, if you're a 6, you need to make sure that you find a 4 or whatever this is in order so that you have all this compatibility. And, you know, I understand that personality tests are fun to talk about. There's a lot of interesting things surrounding them. They're great in staff environments and these things. But my point of this episode is I want to bring to your attention that I don't believe the Enneagram is just simply another personality test. According to the Enneagram Institute, it says that each person is born with what they call a dominant type. And that type, as I mentioned, will never change. According to their website, it's part of who you are, an innate part of your nature, what they call Enneagram energy. That again should kind of raise some red flags for Christians when you start hearing some of this really what couldn't be described as anything other than new age sort of language surrounding the Enneagram test. Now, the ultimate goal according to the Enneagram is to do what they call is to transcend your number. See, right here, we're starting to hear not just new age language, but we're starting to hear really Gnostic ideology. This idea that we have to kind of transcend, that we have to reach some sort of enlightenment. And that is then what kind of opens up our mind and opens up our personality in order to kind of find, you know, success and harmony within the universe. And there's a lot of that sort of language within the Enneagram literature. So according to the Enneagram Institute, it states that the Enneagram helps educate people on their type and respond to certain scenarios or emotions. For instance, a nine when angry could resort to what they call their eight wing, which is sort of a side number that you have along with your personality and become a challenger, even though their personality type is normally the peacemaker. So it goes into this continuum, trying to help people understand their personality, how to kind of walk through and get direction during times of growth, how to face conflict, how to find other people that you're compatible with. The interesting thing about this is that many Christians are actually using the Enneagram to determine who they should marry or even if they married the right person. People often ask like what are the best compatible types to go together or are there any types that I should definitely stay away from? Can Enneagram 8s have a healthy marriage with a type 4? I'm a 5 struggling with my relationship with a type 2. What do we do? Should we break up? Is this a bad combination? Well, on the surface, the Enneagram might seem like a great way to learn about yourself and learn about others and figure out who you're compatible with. It's not so much the actual description of the test that should be most concerning to Christians. It's actually the origin of where it came from. And while the Enneagram has really exploded in popularity since about the year 2018, my guess is that many of you, if you're anything like me, that you have assumed that the Enneagram was part of some sort of ancient Gnostic framework or Gnostic system that got dug up. What I found out later is that this was actually just a marketing talking point, that the Enneagram was actually first developed in 1916. The founder of the Enneagram was a man by the name of Jorge Gurdjieff, and he was sort of a spiritual esoteric. He was an occultist who was searching for religion. He was not trying to put together a personality profile or a personality test at all. So as Gurdjieff dove into the Enneagram further in sort of the sequence of numbers, he really started developing his own religion. He created the Enneagram as a diagram in order to understand the laws of the universe. He said that all laws of the universe fit into the Enneagram. He said it could explain anything about human existence. He put a musical scale within it. He used it to talk about laws of physics and other aspects of sort of the created order. And for him, this numerical system, it summed up everything that man needed to know about the mysteries of the universe. 